Welcome to Beneath the Bible, where we're helping you dig deeper and uncover the world beneath the sacred book. Now, who doesn't like seeing a rainbow? It's always a bit exciting after a storm when you can spot a rainbow breaking through the clouds. In our culture, we have pretty much only positive associations with rainbows. Rainbows are used as symbols for peace and hope for the future. They've become symbols of change and marking new beginnings. Now, the origin of this positive imagery largely comes from the Bible. According to interpretive tradition, the rainbow was the sign of God's covenant with Noah, and by extension with all of humanity, to not destroy the world by flood. Now, that's a good thing. But is that interpretive tradition accurate? Did God actually give the rainbow as a sign to Noah, or was the sign given to Noah actually something else? We're going to dig into that question now. Following the global flood in Genesis 6 and 7, the waters recede and Noah and his family exit the ark. Noah builds an altar and offers sacrifice to God, and God blesses Noah and his family. God proceeds to make a covenant with Noah. Noah and his sons will be given dominion over the earth, but they must not eat the blood of an animal. They must be fruitful and multiply, and they cannot kill another human being. God then states his side of the covenant, that he will never again destroy the earth by flood. God then gives Noah a sign by which to remember this covenant in Genesis 9, verses 13 through 16. We'll read from the New American Standard Bible since it's a very literal or word-for-word -word translation. And we'll see that the words here are particularly important. Here's how this passage reads. God says, I have set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall serve as a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. It shall come about when I make a cloud appear over the earth that the rainbow will be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the rainbow is in the cloud, then I will look at it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. So, that's pretty cut and dry, right? God sets his rainbow in the cloud as a sign of the covenant. And whenever he brings clouding clouds, which is the literal Hebrew here, I don't know what other kind of clouds there are. Anyway, a rainbow will be seen in the cloud. It seems that the rainbow is set between God in heaven and humans on earth. It is spatially between humans and God in the clouds, which seems appropriate for a sign of a covenant between God and humanity. Now, interestingly, in verse 16, it seems that this sign is as much for God to see as for people. When the rainbow is in the cloud, then God will look at it, and he will remember his covenant. So, a rainbow fits the bill here, right? The word used is keshet, which means a bow, like an arcing shape. Biblical Hebrew doesn't have a specific word for rainbow. Keshet can mean rainbow. This is clear from Ezekiel 128, which uses keshet to explicitly mean a rainbow. But the word is used a lot of other places in the Bible, 76 times in the Old Testament. And of those 76 usages, in 72 of them, keshet is clearly an archery bow, as in a bow and arrow. So is the usage here in Genesis 9 actually referring to a rainbow, or could it be referring to another kind of bow? Maybe. But it's not as clear in the text as we usually assume it to be. Rainbows are actually somewhat rare in the Middle East, and not just because a lot of the Middle East is arid. Because of Israel's latitude, rainbows are infrequently visible from the ground. So that's not a great sign as a marker of a covenant, something that only shows up once in a great while. Furthermore, rainbows come after rain, and there's no indication that there's any rain in Genesis 9. The rain stops in chapter 8, verse 2, when God halts the floodwaters, so there's no rain in Genesis 9. In fact, the word for cloud used here, anon, has a more general sense of mist or cloud cover, or even associated with a the theophany. When the Bible references a specific cloud, especially a rain cloud, the word av is used. If Keshet here is a rainbow which comes after rain, what's the cognitive connection with the covenant to not destroy the world with a flood? If rainbows come after it rains, it seems the rainbow may come too late to remind God of his end of the bargain. Instead of a rainbow, a number of biblical scholars see the Keshet here as God's bow, and there's actually a lot of good reasoning for this. For one, this is by far the most common usage of the word throughout the rest of the Bible, especially in Genesis. Isaac tells Esau to get his quiver and Keshet and hunt him some game in Genesis 27. 
Ishmael is referred to as a bowman, using the same word. The bow can refer to either a hunter's bow or a warrior's bow. Human kings use bows, and they're paralleled with their swords. Some great warriors are noted for their bow skills. God uses a bow as a weapon in Psalm 7 and Habakkuk 3. <clears throat> Habakkuk 3 is a particularly noteworthy as this passage shows God as the warrior overcoming chaotic forces, which is certainly a motif present in the flood narrative. The flood in Genesis 6 and 7 is, in many ways, an act of uncreation. It's a resurgence of the chaotic, watery forces that were brought into order at creation. Tahom is said to be the source of the flood waters. This means that the warrior god restoring order is certainly a motif to keep in mind as we interpret this question. Beyond the Bible, we see in both text and imagery that kings and gods use the bow not only in battle, but as a symbol of their victory. In royal iconography, kings use the bow as a symbol for their power. From the New Kingdom in Egypt, pharaohs were depicted as smiting their enemies from their chariot with a drawn bow. This has become a standard scene showing pharaonic power. In Neo-Assyrian wall reliefs, we see kings in displays of power and authority with the bow. The gods use the bow as well. The god Asher is seen here in a winged disc with his bow drawn. On the aptly named Broken Obelisk, we see four prisoners bowing before the king, and above them, reaching down from the winged disc, are two hands. One in a gesture of blessing, and the others offering a bow. This can be understood as the god transferring authority or power to the king. He's clearly blessing and seems to be offering the bow as a symbol of that power. In ancient Near Eastern texts, we see the bow of the gods featuring in important and similar ways to Genesis 9. In the myth of Anzu, the warrior and hunter god Ninurta uses his bow to defeat Anzu, and with Anzu's defeat, there is an ordering of the waters. The right water is brought back to the rivers. In the Enuma Elish, Marduk defeats Tiamat with several weapons, including a bow. After the battle, the god Anu blesses the bow. He gave it three names, including Bostar, and gave it a seat among the gods. He says it will shine in the sky. Babylonian astronomical texts discuss a star they called Kashtum, or Bostar. Scholars who have studied this suggest this was the constellation Canis Minor, the little dog, which is dominated by the very bright star we know as Sirius. This constellation was even important for Egypt as they tracked their own calendar. And this was a highly visible star that had major significance in the astronomical studies of the ancient world. So it's not actually clear if the Keshet in Genesis 9 is referring to a rainbow or to another kind of bow. Ezekiel makes it clear that this word can mean a rainbow. Tradition interprets this as a rainbow. But there's strong evidence that it may not have been originally conceived of as a rainbow. Gods and kings used the bow as a symbol of their power. And in texts, we see the bow being decisive for victory. We see it being placed in the heavens. We see the gods offering it to the king on the broken obelisk as a sign of their divinely given authority. Now there's certainly a lot of evidence that the sign of God's bow in the clouds could be something other than a rainbow. Now let's think about the content of this covenant. God is giving authority to human beings to have dominion over the earth. Now there are stipulations on this authority to be sure, but God is giving Noah and his descendants authority over the plants and animals. As a visible sign between them, quite literally, God puts his bow in the cloud so he will be reminded of the covenant. Now, it's notable that God doesn't give his bow to Noah, but places it in a location where it will be visible between God and the earth and where only God could reach it. Now, this bow could also be seen as a sign of God's victory, possibly over the chaotic Tahom, whose waters God commanded to flood the earth and return it to its primeval state. Although in Genesis, God is fully in control of Tahom, the bow as a sign of victory could be left over from other ancient Near Eastern myths like the Enuma Elish, which depict conflict between the ordering God and the watery forces of chaos like Tiamat. So, was it a rainbow? Maybe. Was it a warrior's bow? Maybe. Was it a constellation or a star associated with a bow? Maybe. Now, to me, the most likely explanation is that the Israelites interpreted the rainbow, even though it was a rare sight for them, as the bow of Yahweh placed in the clouds as a sign of kingship and victory. I kind of like the idea that it was a constellation or star set in the sky. So, why have we taken you on this journey if our conclusion is the same as the one that you probably started the video with? Well, we wanted to show you that there's a lot of background behind God's use of the bow as the sign of his covenant with Noah in Genesis 9. And there is some ambiguity in the text that probably doesn't come through in translation. 
The significance of the bow as a symbol of kingship and covenant would have required no explanation for ancient readers. But today we read about God placing a rainbow in the clouds and we just think, well, isn't that pretty? The rainbow is a sign of God's power and authority, entrusted in covenant with humankind and guaranteeing that God will never again unleash the forces of chaos to recreate the world. Thanks for joining us for this Beneath the Bible video. If you liked what you saw, be sure to give this video a like and hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any future videos. You can also follow us on social media on Twitter and Facebook at Beneath the Bible. If you learned something new today, take a minute to share this video with your friends. And until next time, keep digging.